That's one of the best presentations I've ever heard in my lifetime. Thank you so much. It's so well presented. Mike's back. Thank you, Dr. Dransfield. Next on our agenda, please welcome Ted Walworth, MD, experience with Doctors Without Borders. Good morning, it's still the morning. Um, I was, did general surgery here in town for uh, 33 years at both hospitals, and uh, after my retirement in 2010, I still felt I had my surgical chips and, and strength and knowledge, so I uh, applied to and was accepted by uh, Doctors Without Borders, and I'm, I'm wearing the, the uh, shirt that I wore all that while. Um, and this is my daily uniform, no, no coat and tie after when you're in Africa or Haiti. Um, and I did four missions, uh, three in Africa and one in, uh, and one in Haiti. And along the way, I picked up a two-volume work called Primary Surgery. Because when you, when, you, when you are the only surgeon for hundreds of miles around, suddenly a guy who spent a lot of time taking out gallbladders and fixing hernias suddenly has to treat broken legs, has to do a cesarean section, this, that, and the other thing. A lot of, a lot of burn uh, grafting, uh, wound care, and everything. And so this, this uh, book on primary surgery is, uh, was, was uh, invaluable to me. And chapters on orthopedics, chapters on neurology, chapters on maternal child, uh, child care uh, were very instructive for me, very helpful. But the, really the reason I'm here today is, is because the volume two of this was on trauma, you know, broken bones, and eye injuries, this, that, and the other thing, burns. And it, what struck me, and these chapters go on page after page after page, what struck me is that on page 92 of the trauma volume, it's, it's atomic trauma. And let's just say that this chapter is only five pages long. The point being that a surgeon, an internist, a pediatrician, OPGYN, <laughs> can't really treat the victims, the mass victims of the uh, nuclear holocaust. And uh, I'm not going to reiterate anything that's, that's been said already. Uh, Dr. Dransfield's uh, presentation said it all. But I'll just conclude with uh, reading the uh, last paragraph here. As physicians and surgeons are calling us to prevent sickness where we can, to cure it, to cure it when we cannot prevent it, and to comfort the sick whom we cannot cure. Our challenge now is to make the ultimate supreme effort in the history of our profession to do our bit to prevent mankind, all 4.3 billion, this was written in 1997, we're now up to 8 billion, uh, to prevent all 8 billion of us from destroying ourselves in the ultimate catastro cat catastrophic act excuse me, of global suicide, with the absolute possibility that it might all happen by mistake. And they go on to suggest an, addition, an additional paragraph to the Hippocratic Oath, which I remember taking uh, 52 years ago. As a physician of the 20th century, I recognize <laughs> that nuclear weapons have presented my profession with a challenge of unprecedented proportions that a nuclear war would be the final epidemic for mankind. I will do all my power to work for the prevention of nuclear war. And this just underscores what you've heard already. But um, and doctors should all participate in this fight and be joined by all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next speakers, please uh, come forward, Denny Dreyer and Fred Berger. On February 25th, 1981, Pope John II addressed 10,000 people at Peace Memorial Park in Hiroshima. Here are a few excerpts from his remarks. War is the work of man. War is destruction of human life. War is death. To remember the past is to commit ourselves to the future. To, re to remember Hiroshima is to abhor nuclear war. To remember Hiroshima is to commit oneself to peace. To 
to remember what the people of this city suffered, is to renew our faith in humankind, in their capacity to do what is good, in their freedom to choose what is right, in their determination to turn disaster into a new beginning. In the face of the man-made calamity that every war is, one must affirm and reaffirm again and again that the waging of war is not inevitable or unchangeable. Humanity is not destined to self-destruction. While the moral authority of the Roman Catholic Church on war and peace is compromised by the now obsolete just war theory, by the doctrine of discovery teachings in the 1400s and by other injustices. The more recent teachings, beginning with Pope John XXIII's encyclical, Patrim in Terrace in 1963, give us hope. These teachings address the always imminent nuclear threat more clearly and positively. Pope John then called for freezing the arms race and working towards the sermon. Previously, Pope Pius XII had called for an end to world wars. Pope Paul VI was the first pope to travel to the United States, addressing the United, Station, United Nations with his talk to never again war in 1965. In, uh, also later in 65, Pope Paul VI uh, promulgated the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, which originated from the Second Vatican Council, stating, it is our clear duty to strain every muscle in working for the time when all war can be completely outlawed by international consent. Everyone must labor to put an end at last to the arms race and to make a true beginning of disarmament. In 1983, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops released the pastoral letter, The Challenge of Peace, God's Promise in Our Response, stating that nuclear weapons were only justified as there was a clear progress in efforts towards nuclear disarmament. On November 2019, Pope Francis has made his judgment clear, stating, the use of atomic energy for purposes of war is immoral, just as the possessing of nuclear weapons is immoral. As I already said two years ago, we will be judged on this. On January 11th this year, the Santa Fe Archbishop John Wester released his pastoral letter, Living in the Light of Christ's Peace, a conversation toward nuclear disarmament. He quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. The Archbishop continues, we cannot sit back and be silent in the face of our ongoing preparation for nuclear war. It is important to note that the Los Alamos National Laboratory is part of the Santa Fe Archdiocese. I related the previous details to state that the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church on nuclear arms has been clear and consistent since 1963, and that this teaching is the center and core of the Church's teaching. This is stated as clearly as the Ten Commandments and the Sermon of the Mount. This teaching is not only based on religious beliefs, but all, it also based on a hope for humanity. However, putting this hope into a way of life and into action can be overwhelming, despairing. We do not have time to despair. It is extremely helpful to become centered and have friends along for the journey. I have been a member of Pax Fifty main community over the last 40 years friends for the journey that helped me focus. It is important to note that there is at least one other place in Maine where we are remembering Hiroshima. Our Bangor area group is also participating in a vigil to remember Hiroshima as I speak and, and are holding a novena from August 1st through the 9th. Details can be found on the diocesan website under events. Four of our main members are attending Pax Christi USA National Conference in D.C. today, this weekend, celebrating our 50th anniversary, where they're also remembering Hiroshima. I have been joining in on part of that conference virtually. 
Pax Christi is an international organization started in World War II to facilitate the reconciliation of citizens from both sides. It has about 14,000 members. Pax Christi International has co-hosted the Nonviolent and Just Peace Conference with the Pontif Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace held in Rome in, in 2016. The Second Vatican Conference was co-hosted by Pax Christi International in April of 2021. I want to share a few glimpses and thoughts of my journey in confronting nuclear disarmament. Our Pax Christi method of operating is prayer, study, and action. Without prayer, I would not find facing the nuclear demons difficult, if not overwhelming. Without community, I could only hope my faith would survive. A leader in our peace community, Jim Douglas, has written, every program of nonviolence, whether of Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., or St. Francis of Assisi, has emphasized that the beginning of nonviolence and the continuing center of nonviolence is, is prayer, fasting, and the gift of self. This gives me hope. It is hopeful to know that there is a power greater than the nuclear arsenal. I work on remembering that the phrase, do not be afraid, is repeated multiple times in, in, throughout the gospel. While the Christian gospel is not the only belief, I strongly believe that other faiths, motives, and practices help us to face this nuclear threat. I, I would hope that we can inspire you with the motivation to do something to work towards a world without nuclear weapons, a world of peace and justice. There are six groups represented here, groups that are all working towards nuclear disarmament. Join in one of our groups, write the president, write a U.S. senator, or a U.S. congressperson. I suspect that most of us would be available to travel along on your journey towards peace. You are not alone. I will finish my talk quoting the last nine words of Pope Paul VI's 1965 address, speaking in French to the, to the United Nations. Jamais la guerre, jamais la guerre, jamais la guerre. Hello everyone and thank you for being here today. My name is Denny, Denise Denny Dreher. <clears throat> I've been a member of Pax Christi, Maine since it started in 1980 and I I'm now one of the co-coordinators for me. Back in the time when my children were three and four years old, we were in St. Louis, and I <clears throat> was invited to join the, the, American, the uh, Quakers there in their annual commemoration of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At that time, we had an all-night vigil and I had made the suggestion that we have a reading every hour. <clears throat> so they said, all right, you pick the readings. <laughs> and so I went on a three-week binge. Well, my husband got lots of opportunities to spend with the children while he was in school. And, um, and I read everything that I could read, every angle, from the, the military to the, the medical to the psychological, ethical. And it changed my life. I will say that the book that most impacted me was <clears throat> psychologist Robert J. Lifton's book called Death in Life, which was the stories of the Hibakusha, the survivors. So often when we talk about nuclear war and nuclear weapons, we talk about the devastation. But when it comes down to reading the stories of the individual people, and over and over again hearing the horrors that they experienced. And so when Dr. Lifton went back several years later and started to interview them, what became so obvious was that the, the psychological <clears throat> impact of what they experienced was, was so devastating. Um, it was very, very hard to imagine the, the sights they had seen the sense, maybe during the pandemic recent, the last couple of years, when you've been cut off from usual ways of going about life, you get a little sense of that 
kind of sets you off, you know, you just don't feel like things are right. Imagine, imagine just everything around you devastated, that you have no way of communicating with anyone. What about if your cell phone tower isn't working? What about if the television isn't working or the radio? How do you communicate? How do you know where your family is? All those things at the level at which it was back in, in 1945, but that's what their people experienced. And the other thing that they experienced was, you probably heard of survivor guilt, certainly on people and for veterans for peace. <clears throat> We'd know about that. So I just wanted to focus on that's what really got through to me, to my heart. It was the ultimate the horror that people experienced. And why, from that day forward, I mean, I would look at my children sitting across the table and I would see the skin peeling off them, the way it had over the, <coughs> the survivors, the, the descriptions that I had read. And that's when I made my commitment to work to the ending, <coughs> the nuclear threat. I'm sorry, I think I'm dehydrated. <laughs> um, so one form of the ultimate horror that people experienced was the recollection of requests by the dying which could not be carried out, particularly pleas for a few sips of water. Water was withheld not only because of survivors' preoccupation with saving themselves and their own families, but because authorities spread the word that water would have harmful effects upon the severely injured. Yet, Hibakusha retained particularly troubled feelings about these requests, and usually they gave an explanation to the effect that since they were to die anyway, I should have given them the water they wanted so badly. Instead, it turns out that the request for water by the dying, in addition to reflecting the victim's physical state, their shock and dehydration, has special significance in Japanese cultural traditions. It's related to an ancient belief that water can restore life by bringing back the spirit that has just departed or is about to depart from the body. A Japanese version of a universal tendency to equate water and life. Associated with the belief, there has evolved a general custom for water to be requested by and offered to the dying. These pleas by A-bomb victims were therefore as much psychological expressions of old cultural symbolism as they were of physical need. One might well say they were pleas for life itself. The survivor's failure to acquiesce to them, whatever his reasons, came to have the psychological significance for him of refusing another's request for the privilege of life while he himself clung so tenaciously to that same privilege. That's a quote from Dr. J. Robert J. Lifton. And so in that context, I would ask you to accept this poem entitled, Give Me Water, which was written by Tamiki Hara, one of the Yabaksha, who ultimately terminated her victim's survivor's life by suicide. So just take a breath, close your eyes, imagine what it's like. You want water. Give me water. Oh, give me water to drink. Let me have some. I want rather to die. To die. Oh, help me, oh help me, water, a bit of water, I beg you, won't anyone, oh, 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 oh. Heaven split, the streets are gone, the river, the river flowing on. Oh, 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 
I would like to, to close this part of my remembrance by sharing with you the closing prayer that Pope John Paul II gave <coughs> at Hiroshima. As Fred mentioned, there were 10,000 people there at the memorial site. <coughs> so join with me however you wish. To the creator of nature, and humanity, <coughs> of truth and beauty, I pray. Hear my voice, for it is the voice of the victims of all wars and violence among individuals and nations. Hear my voice, for it is the voice of all children who suffer and will suffer when people put their faith in weapons and war. Hear my voice when I beg you to instill into the hearts of all human beings the wisdom of peace, the strength of justice, and the joy of fellowship. Hear my voice for I speak for the multitudes in every country and in every period of history who do not want war and are ready to walk the road to peace. Hear my voice and grant insight and strength so that we may <clears throat> always respond to hatred with love, to injustice with total dedication to justice, to need with the sharing of self, and to war with peace. O oh God, hear my voice and grant unto the world your everlasting peace. Amen. I'm sure most of you have noticed that I'm wearing the colors of Ukraine today and they are always in my thoughts. Please welcome now Suzanne Hedrick will lead us in song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Then we'll be going out to the monument for a moment of silence. Again, if anybody wants to say anything, I'll, uh, I'll call on you. I'm going to ask Mr. Mayors over here to carry the wreath out. Before you leave, I hope you'll uh, take one of the cranes that are in the back of the room. Uh, they were donated by a gentleman whose wife uh, was making them uh, to prevent her early death. She conceived, in, in the, but the cranes are there for you to take home and use as a reminder of what this day is all about. And you have your sheet music, there's more. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, we are family. Let us walk with each other in perfect harmony. Let 
Setting all the people free. Yeah. 